We're going to do the next kitab, Al-Qawaid Al-Fiqiyah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, lahu alhamdu al-hasan, wa al-thana'u al-jameen, wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tabi'ina lahum bihsanin ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd. Inshallah ta'ala, we're now going to move on to the second book, which is Manzumatul Qawaid al-Fiqiyah, written by Shaykh al-Allama, Abdul Rahman ibn Nasir al-Si'diyu rahimahullah. Naam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. الحمد لله العلي الأرفق وجامع الأشياء والمفرق ذي النعم الواسعة الغزيرة الغزيرة والحكم الباهرة الكثيرة ثم الصلاة مع سلام دائم على الرسول القرشي الخاتم وآله وصحبه الأبرار الحائز مراتب الفخ مراتب الفخ فخار اعلم هديت أن أفضل المنن علم يزيل يزيل الشك عنك والدرن والدرن ويكشف الحق لذي القلوب ويوصل العبد إلى المطلوب. The author رحمه الله he authored عبد الرحمن ابن ناصر السعدي wrote a kitab called القواعد الفقية. What does قواعد الفقية deal with? It is in English legal maxims. قواعد الفقية is what? Legal Islamic maxims. You're gonna learn principles. In which the religion goes back to and this is the way forward in gaining knowledge we can't memorize the sub branches they're too much what we should focus on is the qawaid and the principles what will that allow us what it will allow us is to bring back all of the sub branches to that the poet he said فَدِينُنَا لَمْ يَخْلُ عَنْ حُكْمٍ عَلَى مَرِّ الزَّمَانِ لَوْ بَدَى مَا أَعْضَلَى لِأَنَّهُ قَدْ اِحْتَوَى قَوَاعِدًا تُسْتَخْرَجُ الْأَحْكَامَ تُسْتَخْرَجُ الْأَحْكَامَ عَنْهَا رَاشِدًا فَدِينُنَا لَمْ يَخْلُ عَنْ حُكْمٍ عَلَى هُدِيتَ أَنَّا أَفْضَلَ الْمِ... Uh, sorry. And uh, the poet he said, فَدِينُنَا Our religion has not left out anything that we would need. Anything that will bring us closer to Allah. Anything that will take us to Jannah. Anything that will distance us from the hellfire, our religion has told us about it. Also, our religion, our deen, what, it, it, what it's also done is, any issues of our worldly affairs, our religion has also provided us with what? A solution. How do we work in this particular situation? Our religion has done that. But how has it done it? Has it spoken about everything by its name? No. Principles. It gave us principles. So inshallah ta'ala, this book, we're going to study those principles. The, the author, rahimahullah, he started the book with the basmala. So he said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Thumma thalla bil hamdala. And then he said, Alhamdulillah. Thumma thalla bil salati was salam. And then number three, he sent, he sent peace and salutation onto the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, and on his companions. These three, which is basmala. Hamdala and as salah and as salam. This is called adab tasnif, the manners of authorship. The manner of what? Authorship. When you author, you say Bismillah, you also say Alhamdulillah, and you also say Was salatu was salamu ala Rasulillahi wa alihi wa sahbi. This is called adab tasnif, the manners and the way to author a book. Then the author said, "Ilam hudi ta anna afdal al minan. Ilm yuzilu shakka anka wa daran, wa yakshifu al haqa li dil qulubi, wa yusilu al abda ila al matlubi. Fahris ala fahmik lil qawaidi, jamiat al masail al shawaridi, li tartaqi fi al ilm khayr murtaqa, wa taktafi subul al ladi qadu fika." The author, rahimahullah, he says, "Ilam know, ilam know, have knowledge, ilam hudi ta may Allah guide you." Brothers, pay attention. Ilam. The author started his poetry with I'lam. After he said, Alhamdulillah, Bismillah, and Alhamdulillah, and as salah ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as salah wa salam ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbi, he said, I'lam, have knowledge. Why is he saying have knowledge? Because it's important to have knowledge, brothers. I'lam, have knowledge. What's the definition of knowledge? Three things. Knowledge is three points. Idraku shay ala ma hu alayhi idrakan jazima. It is to perceive something. That's number one. Knowledge is what? Perception of something. Idraku shay. That's number one. 
ala ma huwa as it is that's number 2 idraka jazima with certainty that's 3 if those 3 tick 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 is knowledge perception someone asked you what is this in your head there's a perception there's an idea in your head that's number 1 the second one is the thought in your head and the reality of this thing they go hand in hand it is correct that's the point number two number three is that you're certain there's no doubt in your heart that this is a cup if you say mm, it's not called ilm those are the three points idraku shay ala ma hu idrakan jaziman that's knowledge so ilam have knowledge means have those three things intact have those three things present in you are we all together brothers that's what it means ilam no Hudita, may Allah guide you. May Allah what? Guide you. The guidance is two types. Write this down. The reason why we say the guidance is two types is because in the Quran, when we look, Allah affirms in one place guidance for the Prophet وسلم, and in another place, Allah negates guidance from the Prophet. Like for example, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ Muhammad, you can't guide whoever you want. Allah is the one who guides. So the Prophet, he's told here he can't do guidance. But then we have another ayah where Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانُ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ وَإِنَّكَ يُو مُحَمَّدْ لَتَهْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ You guide to the straight path. So the question here is, what is the guidance that's been affirmed here for the Prophet and that it's said that he has? And what is the guidance that Allah is negating for the Prophet here? It's easy. The guidance is two types. The guidance which is Hidayah to Dalala. Hidayah to Dalala. Hidayah to Dalala means what? And brothers, it's important to give uh, importance is to, to give importance to your makharij, your pronunciation. Okay, when you pronounce the Arabic language, it's very important that you give importance to pronouncing words correctly. Because the word dalala is biddali, is dal. And if you say dalala as a dad, which is another makhraj, the meaning become two opposite meanings. Hidayah to dalala biddali, it means the hidayah, the guidance of showing the path. Whereas hidayah to dalala, it's the opposite. Dalala, you all know what it means. It means misguidance. So how can it be the, the guidance of misguidance? It's, it's an oxymoron, as they call it in the English language. So, dal. Hidayah to dalala. The first type of guidance is called hidayah to? Hidayah to dalala, which is to show the path. Nabi Allah Muhammad can do that, and that's the one Allah affirmed for the Prophet. The guidance that's negated from the Prophet and anybody else is, is what? Hidayah to irshad. Sorry, Hidayah to Tawfiq. Hidayah to Tawfiq. Hidayah to Tawfiq means placing the, God, the truth in the person's heart. That's something Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cannot do and we can't also do it. Only Allah tabaraka ta'ala does that. So the author here is saying, I'lam no hudita. May Allah guide you. Meaning, may Allah take the truth and place it in your heart. Only Allah can do that. May Allah do that for you subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the guidance is two types. The first one is Hidayah to Dalala and the second one is called Hidayah to At-Tawfiq. Hidayah to Tawfiq. And that's the one Allah negated from the Prophet. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ اِعْلَمْ نَوْ هُدِيتَ مَا اللَّهِ guide you أَنَّ أَفْضَلَ الْمِنَنْ The greatest blessing, the greatest bliss is knowledge, brothers. Ah, oh, Allah. The Shaykh is saying the best blessing is knowledge. But what knowledge is the best? It's the knowledge that has two characteristics. Write this down. The knowledge that has two characteristics is the beneficial knowledge. You always hear beneficial knowledge, right? Which, what is beneficial knowledge? It is, the Shaykh mentioned to you, اعلم يديت أن أفضل المنن علم يزيل الشك عنك ودرن it is the knowledge that removes from you harm. It removes from you deficiency. That's number one. 
And the second is, it replaces it with completeness. And it, re I don't even think completeness is an English word. I just made that up, by the way. Completeness is not an English word. I just always say it. It's incorrect. It's made up. I added that suffix at the ending. Ness. Bel kamalat. Meaning it brings about that which completes you as a person. So the first thing is that it gets rid of those deficient things that are in you. What are the, some of the examples of deficient things that knowledge gets rid of? Arrogance. Because the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. So, the more you study, the more you learn. Uh, Ajit, I don't know nothing. So, so it gets rid of that trait. Remember, people who are knowledgeable are generally quiet. They don't talk too much. Uh, because you know what the scholars they say? They say an empty vessel sounds more than a full one. Sah? The empty cup, it makes a lot of noise. The one who's ignorant, he makes a lot of noise. He's always shouting, screaming. The knowledgeable person is full, so he doesn't make, he doesn't make noise. Does, does that make sense? So it gets rid of these traits. Knowledge gets rid of those naqais and those afat. Second, the beneficial knowledge brings about completeness. It completes you as a person. It fills you up with good traits. And those good traits are humility and humbleness. It brings about um, eagerness to listen. You listen more often. You question good questions. Some knowledgeable people ask good questions. They ask, mm, well, what about this? Even a person who is has no Islamic knowledge you want to know their life so you can take life experience from them so you say when you were young what, what did, how did you grow up? Ha. what did you do in that situation? Ha. you know these things down because you learn from experiences itself is knowledge the wise man that's what he does he takes everybody's and takes it down but well, I'll tell you something in the west one of the things that shocked me the most is they value data collection. Western countries, they love data, information, surveys, data collection, the progression of their business, looking at other ventures. They give so much info. They will pay billions just to gain information. Billions. The money is insignificant. The information is what they want. Collecting data and knowing. Is that they honor that. Us, work about the enough. Don't talk too, too much to me. Just give me the money. That's what we're just giving the money. We just want that. We just want the money. Sah? A wise person, brothers, he's eager to know. And he's eager to complete those little things that are missing. Let me fill these things up. So, this is what beneficial knowledge means. That's what the author is saying. إعلم هديت أن أفضل المين العلم يزيل الشك عنك ودرا ويكشف الحق لذي القلوب ويوصل العبد إلى المطلوب. Okay, good, good. What was the first characteristics of beneficial knowledge? It gets rid of what? Deficiency, right? Ah. What deficiencies does it get rid of? The Sheikh mentioned it to you, write it down. It gets rid of two deficiencies. It gets rid of doubt. Beneficial knowledge, the deficiency that it gets rid of is doubt. You become certain. Conviction starts to come. You know why you see a lot of people who don't know what to do in their life and they're always like, I don't know what to do, I don't know. It's lack of knowledge. You just, the road becomes blurry. Things are not clear for you. The more you learn, the more you know what you want in life. And the more you, want know, you know what to achieve. That's number one. Shak. By the way, brothers, shak, doubt is one of the greatest things that bring about depression and anxiety. ولذلك الله تبارك وتعالى ودي سيبا the disbelievers بل كذبوا بالحق لما جاءهم فهم في أمر مريج ما معنى مريج when the truth came to them they disbelieved in it and Allah says that they are in confusion they're just confused one day they're calling him a ساحر another time they're calling him a, a, a شاعر a poet they can't make their mind up what is Nabi Muhammad. Give him one title and call him that. They can't. They're confused. Why are they confused? Because they went against the truth. 
So the first characteristics that he gets rid of, the author, uh, by the way, I'm not getting anything from anywhere outside, is what the Sheikh is mentioning. Ilmun yuzilu shakka, it gets rid of shakka. Wad daran, and daran means it gets rid of the taint on your heart. See, in order to gain knowledge, you have to see. There has to be a vision. There is that, something that can blur that vision. Knowledge, what does it do? It lifts that. It lifts it. These are the two things. It gets rid of doubt. And it also gets rid of what? The ability of not seeing things. Now someone may ask, what's the difference between shak and that? Shak means you can see both, but you don't know which one to pick. Like in Daran is what? When you can't even see both. Knowledge gets rid of both. Uh, knowledge, beneficial knowledge removes that from you. You start to know what you want. Okay? وَيَكْشِفُ الْحَقَّ لِذِي الْقُلُوبِ And what does it give you? It gives you the ability to see what you want in life and what you want to achieve and attain. And it gives you clarity to the truth. That's what Allah said in Surah Al-Qaf. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَذِكْرًا When he mentioned about death and Allah spoke about Akhira and Allah spoke about Jahannam. يَوْمَ نَقُولُ لِجَهَنَّمَ هَلِمْ تَلَأْتِ وَتَقُولُ هَلِمْ الْمَزِيدِ After all of that, Allah said, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَذِكْرًا This is a reminder. For who? لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْبٌ أَوْ أَلْقَ السَّمْعَ وَهُوَ شَهِيدٌ it, all of this is a reminder for a person who comes with two qualities. He listens. He gives his ear. A lot of people, we, we don't listen. We don't listen. We lack the ability of listening. And the day of judgment, one of the things that we're going to regret the most is what? Allah says, Listening. And also what? Your heart, the f whatever was on it, getting taken off it. The truth becomes clear to you. That's what the author, Rahimahullah, says. وَيُوصِلُ الْعَبْدَ إِلَى الْمَطْلُوبِ And it will make you reach the goal that you're trying to achieve. Beneficial knowledge, brothers, it shows you the truth and it even allows you to get to your goal. That's what beneficial knowledge does for you. That's the outcome. Naam. Hey, yeah. فاحرص على فهمك للقواعد جامعة المسائل والشوارد فترتقي في العلم في العلم خير مرتقى وتقتفي سبل الذي قد وفقا وهذه قواعد نظمتها من كتب من كتب أهل 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 العلم قد حصلتها جزاهم المولى عظيم الأجر والعفو من غفرانه والبر the author, Rahimullah, he says, فَحَرِصْ عَلَى فَهْمِكَ لِلْقَوَاعِدِ جَامِعَةِ الْمَسَائِلِ الشَّوَارِدِ فَتَرْتَقِي فِي الْعِلْمِ خَيْرَ مُرْتَقَى وَتَقْتَفِي سُبُلَ الَّذِي قَدْ وُفِّقَى فَحْرِصْ strive. What do you do? فَحْرِصْ عَلَى فَهْمِكَ لِلْقَوَاعِدِ Brothers, it's hard to memorize فُرُوعُ الْمَسَائِلِ What do I mean by فُرُوعُ الْمَسَائِلِ For example, fiqh. We have as Shafi'i, the madhab I, I follow, is the Shafi'i Madhab, for example. We have a kitab that in our country and within the Shafi'i Madhab we study. It's called Kitab Al-Minhaj and it's written by Nawawi. Huh? What is it called? Minhaj. Written by who? Abu Zakariya Nawawi, rahimahullah. The Kitab Al-Minhaj has 60,000 masail fiqhiyya in it. How am I going to memorize all of that? 60,000 masail. How is that going to go all in my head? How am I going to keep that in my head when I need it? It's hard. Are we all together, brothers? That's just one book. Then there's the kitab called Irshad al Ghawi by Ibn, Ibn Mukri, which has 90,000 masail in there. And that's just two books now we're reached in fiqh. How is, how is a person who the Prophet said, A'mar ummati ma bayna sitin wa sab'in, my umma is going to live between 60 to 70, wa kalilun man yajuzu dalik, and little go over 70. How am I going to memorize all of that and keep it in my head? I can't. So, this is where the scholars they said, Look, let's write qawaid, principles, that maybe 2,000 masail might come under one qaida. Good. So, you memorize the qaida, you hold onto this qaida, somebody mentions something, you're like, It comes under this qaida, it comes under this qaida. Fahris, that's why the author is saying to you. Fahris ala fahmika lil qawaidi. Strive, put effort in understanding qawaid. Jami'atil masail shawaridi. So many different sub branches that are dispersed, all of them will come under it. I'll give you an example. One of the qawaids that we're going to come across now is called Al Umuru bi maqasidiha. 
things are based on their intention. Things are what? Matters are judged based on their intention. This is a qa'idah. This enters, as an Imam Shafi'i said, يَدْخُلُ سِتِينَ بَابًا مِنْ أَبْوَابِ الْفِقْرِ 70 chapters of fiqh, I can use this one qa'idah. And Imam Shafi'i said this. How? A man is married to a woman. Him and his wife are married. We know if the man divorces his wife, بِلَفْضٍ صَرِيحٍ A clear statement, statement. For example, he says to her, طَلَّقْتُكِ I've divorced you. She becomes divorced. This doesn't... We already, we already see what he said. We'll consider that to be one divorce. But he didn't. He used an indirect speech. Him and his wife had a quarrel and he said to her, go home, go to your mom. Go back to your mom's house. Or he said to her, you're free. Now you're free, go to your mom's house. This is called kinaya. This one now, we can't give a ruling to it. What do we need? We need his intention. It goes into the qa'idah, which is al-umuru. Al-umuru bi maqasidiha. Am I, am I, uh, are we all together, brothers? So one mas'ala. If this is a, a sub-branch. It happened, somebody came up to me, asked me this question. I know, I know the qa'idah. I'm holding on to this qa'idah. Someone asked me this question, I was saying, al-umuru bi maqasidiha. What did you intend? Wallahi, I didn't intend divorce. I only went, I was angry. I just wanted her to go to her mom's house. I think about it. And then later we can come together. Okay, good. We, we will take what you say. Another man came. He, Janaba happened to him. Major impurity happened to him. He woke up and from an intimate relationship with his spouse. Ghusl is wajib on him. Sahih? Ghusl is wajib, right? He went into the shower. He didn't even intend ghusl. He got the water, splashed it over himself. When he came out, what did he do? He said, I showered. I'm clean now. Do I have to do ghusl? What do we say? We say, yes. Al-umuru bi maqasidiha. Did you come with the intention of ghusl? Because the intent of ghusl going is based on what? The intention. You didn't come with the intention. Even that though the objective was met, which is that he's clean. But no, the intention is missing. Are we all together? Another example. In the month of Ramadan, what does the person have to do the night before Ramadan, the day before Ramadan comes in? In the night. He has to come with the intention that he's going to fast tomorrow. Sahih. The Prophet said, Man lam siyama fala siyama lahu. The person who does not intend and come with an intention the night before, then the day he has no fasting. So Ramadan, the scholars differ amongst themselves. Does he have to come with the intention every single night of Ramadan? Or does he, is it enough for him to come with it once for the whole entire month of Ramadan? Some scholars, there's difference of opinion. But the point is, there has to be an intention. Are we all together, brothers? What about Sunnah? No. The Sunnah, you don't have to. The Sunnah, you can come home at 10 o'clock and you say to your wife, Honey, is there any food? that you cooked and she says no we didn't cook food yet and you go Inni muru'un sa'imun. I am a fasting man since you didn't give me breakfast and it's 10 p.m. 10 a.m. no problem don't worry I will fast the remaining portion of the day what's the difference this is a nafila and this is a sunnah and the difference between them is the intention how it's dealt with in both situations so brothers I just shown you one qa'idah under it can enter many different masail are we all together Two men are traveling as they're, they're traveling. They're on the flight. Two friends, good friends. He's there, oh, I'm going to travel to Mecca. Another goes, ah, oh, can I travel with you? Yes, come. They both go on the flight. They book the flight from the same agency. They get their ticket sent to their email at the same time. They pay it from one bank card. And they go on the flight together. And they sit right next to each other. And they land in Mecca. One is rewarded and the other one isn't rewarded. How? The action is the same. This one went to Mecca to do Umrah and that was his intention. The other one went to Mecca because he was going to marry someone in Mecca. It's not a sin, but the difference between them is what? The intention. Do you see, brothers, how it changes everything? So, فَحْرِصْ عَلَى فَهْمِكَ لِلْقَوَاعِدِ 
give importance to memorizing, even memorizing qawaid principles. Under that, so many sub branches will fall under it. Look what he said Fatartaki fil ilmi khaira murtaka. You will grow. You will go on the ladder of knowledge a nice way. And you're going to take the path of the people of knowledge who reach their goal. Then he said to you, وَهَذِهِ قَوَاعِدُ النَّظَمْتُهَا I, Abdul Rahman Nasir Al-Sa'di, I have written for you in a full, a poetic form some lines of, uh, some, some, some قَوَاعِد فقية. I've written it here for you. مِنْ كُتْبِ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ قَدْ حَصَّلْتُهَا And I got it only from the books of the people of knowledge. Another thing you find from the humility of the scholars is that they don't claim what isn't theirs. He, he's saying, this is not mine. I only gathered it from the books of the people of knowledge. And I'm giving you guys what I got from the works of the people of knowledge. The author then makes dua for the people of knowledge. And this is another characteristic. One of the great characteristics of a righteous person is he makes dua for those who preceded him. Sah? I will together. Ibn Malik in his Alfiyah, what did he say? He said, فَإِقَةً أَلْفِيَةَ بْنَ مُعْطِي وَهُوَا بِسَبْقٍ حَائِزٌ تَفْضِيلًا مُسْتَوْجِبٌ ثَنَائِيَ الْجَمِيلًا وَاللَّهَ أَرْجُوا بِهِبَاتٍ وَافِرًا لِي وَلَهُ فِي دَرَجَاتِ الْآخِرًا He said, my, my book is better than uh, the book of Ibn uh, Mu'ti's Kitab. Ibn Malik is saying this. It's a thousand line grammar book. My book is better than his book. But he is better than me. Because he came closer to the time of the Prophet than me. Are we all together, brothers? So the Shaykh, rahimahullah, he now goes into the um, the qawaid, uh, inshaAllah ta'ala. Naam. Naam. وَالنِّيَّةُ شَرْطُ لِسَائِرِ الْعَمَلِ بِهَا الصَّلَاحُ وَالْفَسَادُ لِلْعَمَلِ The Shaykh, rahimahullah, he says, وَالنِّيَّةُ شَرْطُ لِسَائِرِ الْعَمَلِ بِهَا الصَّلَاحُ وَالْفَسَادُ لِلْعَمَلِ Actions are based on their intention. Niyya is a condition. It's a prerequisite. And the niyya is what? The intention is a prerequisite. You need to come with it. What's the difference between someone who's praying Dhuhr and Asr as a traveler? What's the difference? Four and four. It's, it's, farq. He's a traveler. He's going to combine the two prayers. What's the difference between Dhuhr and Asr? He's praying them at the same time. What's the difference? The intention, brothers. That's it. There's no difference. He's a traveler. He's going to combine Dhuhr and Asr together. Two and two is going to pray. He can either pray Jab'u Taqdeemin or Jab'u Ta'akhir. He can bring it forward or he can put it back. What is the distinguishing factor between the two? When he prays, he comes with the intention of Salat al-Dur. And this one is what? Write this down, brothers. When the scholars talk about intention, they break it into two. They break it into what? Two. The first one is Tamyuzul ibadat anil adat. Distinguishing a ibadah from a non ibadah thing, a norms, a custom. Distinguishing an ibadah from norms based on intention. Like, for example, what I gave you a man every morning when he wakes up, he showers. It's his normal routine. He's always like this. He loves to always shower. Showering is his thing. He can't go out if he doesn't shower, methelen. Okay? How does he distinguish the morning that he's going to do the shower, his normal shower, and the ghusl janabah? He has to distinguish the ibadah, which is the ghusl, from this adah, his norm, based on an intention. That's the first one. The second one is, تَمْيِيزُ الْعِبَادَاتِ بَعْضِهَا عَنْ بَعْضٍ Distinguishing the ibadah from one another. The ibadah. They're both ibadah, but you're distinguishing one from the other one. And that's the example I gave you, which is the person who's praying, a traveler who's praying Dhuhr and Asr. Both of them are ibadah, but he has to distinguish one from the other. Yeah? He prays Dhuhr and he prays Asr. 
How does he what? Distinguish this one from this one. So it's Tamizul Ibadat Ba'diha and Ba'din. Are we all together? Lacking the word niya, the fuqaha use it in those two that I just mentioned. The two that I just mentioned is the usage of the fuqaha, the scholars of fiqh. The scholars of aqidah, they use the word niya as ikhlas. And ikhlas means who are you doing it for? Who's intent who are you intending? Are we all together, brothers? Who are you doing this action for? Aslan. And that means what? Ikhlas. The fuqaha don't deal with that. Who deal with that? And you study that in the books of what? At Tawheed al Aqidah. Are we all together, brothers? Naam. So, but brothers, I just want you to remember something. There are five. They're called five. They're called khamsa. Khamsa tul qawa'idul kubra. There are five major legal maxims. What are they called? The five great legal maxims. These five major legal maxims are unanimously agreed upon by all of the fuqaha and the jurists. The Islamic fuqaha, meaning Islamic jurists, they all unanimously agree on these five. The first of them is which one? The one that we just took right now, which is al-umuru bimaqasidiha. Every action is based on what you intended. That's the first one. How much is left? We'll come to the next four, inshallah, as we go along. The author now goes into the religion of Islam is a religion that is built upon Jalbul Masalih Wadarul Mafasid. Are we all together, brothers? Our religion is built upon Jalbul Masalih. Mamana Jalbul Masalih, a Tahsilul Masalih, to bring about good and to remove harm. Write that down. Islam. As a religion, its ultimate goal, its objective is to bring to you masalih, benefits, and to repel from you harm. Which one takes precedence over which? So we have Islam is a religion that brings about good and it repels evil. Which one takes precedence? Precedence means here, which one goes first? Repelling the harm or bringing the good? Does everyone understand the question? I said that the religion of Islam, is, it's there. This deen that you're looking at right now, it's taking care of you, brothers. Allah is taking care of you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's observing you. And Allah's laws are in line with your essence and how you are. It was tailored for you. Nothing else can do the job except the religion. Ah. Uh, now that the religion brings these benefits from you and it also repels harm from you, which one should you give importance to? You're in a situation. There's good you can bring or there's harm you can push away. Which one do you go first for? Write this down. Dar'ul mafasidi awla min jalbil masalih. Repelling the harm takes precedence over bringing about good. Okay? Repelling the harm takes precedence over what? Over thinking about bringing good. You're in a situation, you think about getting rid of the harm. Then thinking about bringing good. And that's common sense even, Zahir. If you've got a job and you can get something, but you're going to lose something, you first of all push away what you're going to lose is before you start thinking of what you're going to gain and what you're going to achieve. Sah? Good. Another thing I want you to write down. Yeah? Everything we're going to be examples, evidences. I just first, let's do the sawr of the qawaid, and I'll give you so much examples. 
Let me just mention one example. The Prophet ﷺ, when he came to his wife, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, he said, Ya Aisha, O oh Aisha, Aisha, if your people, meaning Quraysh, and it's the same people as the Prophet, if they were not new to Islam, the Prophet said, Aisha, Aisha, if your people were not new to Islam, I would have destroyed the Kaaba. The part you who's been to the Kaaba? Put your hand up. Who's been to Mecca? Have you guys seen Mecca? There's a, a the part that they call Hijr Ismail. Huh? The Hijr Ismail, you can't do tawaf inside it. True or false? Why? Because it's the Kaaba itself. It's part of the Kaaba. It was meant the, the black was meant to be up to there. That should have been the whole entire. Uh, the whole entire stone should have been that. So the Prophet said, I would have added that extension. But Quraysh, recently the issue of Abraha happened. And Quraysh, Kaaba is something big to them. If Muhammad now goes to Kaaba with all of the rumors that are going on, hey, what's going to happen? The Prophet wants to bring good, but he thought about repelling the harm first. It's good he wants to bring, but the harm is what you need to repel first. So you've thought about Another example, the Prophet sallallahu amongst his people were munafiqeen ma'lumun nifaq. Their hypocrisy was well known. Like Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salon and others. The Sahabas, they said, Ya Rasulullah, ala nadribu unuqa hadha al-munafiq. Why should we not smack the neck of this hypocrite? Let's kill him. Abdullah ibn Ubay said so many bad things about the Prophet. The whole surah al munafiqun came down on him. He's known, the Prophet was told that this man's a munafiq. Then the Prophet وسلم, he said, لا يتحدث الناس أن محمدا يقتل أصحابه. I don't want the people to say that Muhammad kills his own followers. صح? If I kill Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salal, the outside world are going to say Muhammad has not only killed the community outside and he's not only caused bloodshed outside, but he's now turning to his own people and he's murdering them. That's what they're going to say. Don't they won't look at he's a hypocrite or not. صح? So this is مصالح and مفاسد. This is all masalih and mafasid. There's many examples, brothers. Another example that was very present at the time of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah was the Umara and the leaders of the time of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. They used to drink alcohol and they were alcoholics. So some of the scholars of that time, they started to write books in refuting them and uh, advising them on the issue of alcohol. Saying, don't drink alcohol. Uh, ayats, the hadiths regarding what? Alcohol and how it's dangerous drinking alcohol. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said to the scholars of that time, why are you stopping them from drinking alcohol? Let them drink. Hey, why? Because when they are drunk, they are not killing no one. When they are not drunk, they are not killing anyone. And killing is worse than what? Alcohol. So once they are drunk, they are busy with themselves and their own problems. Ibn Taymiyyah is looking at the evil is two types. A evil which is called ma'tiya, which is qasira. It's only to you. You're only doing it to yourself. You're drinking. You're doing your own little haram. Up to you. And the second one is called muta'addi. It's transitive in English. You're not only, it's not only to you. It's other people you're bringing it in. Are we all together? Which one is worse? The one that includes other people is worse than the one that's restricted to you. Sahih? So now, which is the one that the author now mentioned, فَإِن تَزَاحَمَ عَدَدُ الْمَصَالِحِ يُقَدَّمُ الْأَعْلَى مِنَ الْمَصَالِحِ وَضِدُّهُ تَزَاحُمُ الْمَفَاسِدِ يُرْتَكَبُ الْأَدْنَى مِنَ الْمَفَاسِدِ I'm going to come to you, inshallah, soon. The point is, brothers, scholars observe masalih and mafasid and how it works. For example, you're in a situation where someone came up to you and said to you, brother, uh, I want you to teach me a book. And at that particular time that that person is asking you to teach that book to them, you generally pray Qiyamul Layl and you have your Wird Layl and you don't want to stop it. What should you do? Helping this person and teaching them is a benefit, is a maslaha. You praying Qiyamul Layl is a maslaha. Which one's better? Teaching this person is better. Why? 
Because the benefit that's restricted to you is not the same as the benefit that involves someone else. When you pray, you pray by yourself. And they're bringing only yourself benefit. Whereas when you educate this person and you teach them, your benefit is moving on to someone else. It's greater. Are we all together? And then this science of knowing the masalih, in that tazahum is one of the hardest subjects. So, that's why many people come up to you and say, oh, brother, I want to seek knowledge. What do I do with my job and seeking knowledge? Huh? These are always questions people ask. Fiqh of Mufadalatil the virtues between actions and which one should I pick and which one should I not pick and how should I not do it and what should I not do is itself a big chapter. What is it? It's a big chapter. Write this down, brothers. I just said to you, Islam is a religion that brings about what? Benefits. How does it bring about benefits? In two ways. Write this down. Islam brings about benefits in two ways. The first one is it brings a benefit that wasn't there. Islam comes and it initiates. It initiates a brown new benefit. That's the first thing. It initiates it. It starts it. And the second one is it completes the benefit as well. That's number two. What does it do? It increases it and adds on to it. It's the second thing it does. When it comes to removing the evil, how do you remove the evil? Write this down. Write this down. The way that the Sharia removes the evil is in two ways. The first one is, of course, to fully get rid of it and fully eradicate it. Okay, fully remove it from its roots. The religion wants to remove harm from its roots. But if it can't do it, what does it do? It lessens it. What does it do? It lessens it. Reduces it. Ah. So the best point to say about this qaida is The religion is built upon Bringing about good and completing it. And repelling the evil in its essence or reducing it. That's what it is. Brothers, now I want to ask you guys a question. What is a benefit that the religion is bringing? What is a benefit? This is another issue that you tend to find. A maslaha is not determined by you and me. <laughs> A lot of people, the problem is, Wallahi, al masalih wal mafasid. No, brother, this is your personal benefit. It's not a religious benefit, you see? Or a benefit for the organization. He makes it like a religious benefit. No, it's not a religious benefit. It's a benefit only for your organization. We're not talking about that. What is a maslaha is named and coined by and it's mentioned by the sharia. The sharia says this is a maslaha. And who mentions the mafasid? Who mentions the harm? The Sharia. Ah. Are we all together, brothers? Write this down. The Masalih are two types. We, there's many ways we can look at the Masalih, but the Masalih are two types. Okay? The first Maslaha is called Maslahatun Khalisa. Pure Maslaha. This is only Maslaha. There's no harm in this one. It's pure Maslaha. And that is La ilaha illallah. And a Tawheed. That's a maslaha khalisa. Are we all together, brothers? Tawheed is a maslaha khalisa. The second one is called maslaha rajiha. Maslaha rajiha means 80% is a maslaha, but 20% of it is a mafsada. And that is jihad fi sabilillah. Jihad fi sabilillah is not a maslaha khalisa. It's a maslaha rajiha. Because remember, the children are going to be orphans, which is a mafsada. The wife is going to be a widowed. So mafsada, okay, twenty percent or thirty percent, whatever it is, there's a mafsada in it, okay. Are we all together, brothers? The mafasid are two types: mafasid which are khalisa, pure mafsada, that's shirk. And 
Mafsada which is rajih. A mafsada which is rajih. Mafsada is higher than the benefit in it. There's benefit. There's 30% benefit in it. Example for that is alcohol. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا نَفْعِهِمَا مِنْ مَصْلَحَ Is there a benefit in alcohol? Yeah, there is benefit in it. Allah is saying there's a benefit in it. لكن we say it's a مفسد الراجحة. The harm in it is higher than the benefit in it. Are we all together? I don't know if it's true. And don't quote me on this. But they said, Allah alam, it's to those who said it. I'm just, I came across it and I have not verified it in its essence. But they said, a percentage of alcohol that's not overused is beneficial for the heart. Doctors, if it's true, if it's not Allah alam, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> But the point is, we do believe there's benefit in it because Allah said there's benefit in it. Okay? What did Allah say? There is benefit in it. Like if the benefit is so low and the mafas is greater. Are we all together, brothers? That's the types of masalih and the types of mafas. Which one is the one that confuses the people a lot? It's the masalih al rajiha and the mafas al rajiha. This is where all the argumentations always come. No one argues about masalih khalisa. And masalih, mafasid khalisa, unless he is a what? A person who needs a medical attention. No. Anyways, the point I'm trying to say, brothers, is there are so many things that can be spoken about regarding this. And there's a kitab I will encourage you to buy. It's called Qawa'idul Anam fi Masalih. Qawa'idul Ahkam, sorry. Fi Masalih al Anam. Qawa'idul Ahkam fi Masalih al Anam. قواعد الأحكام في مصالح الأنام. It's a two-volume book written by العز بن عبد السلام سلطان العلماء. العز بن عبد السلام has a book on the issue of مصالح المفاسد. That's it. Uh, the whole book is about that. Two volumes. Three hundred something pages here and three hundred something pages. Six hundred something pages or seven hundred pages on just the concept of مصالح المفاسد. صح؟ That's a lot, right? Ibn al-Qayyim in his kitab, in his I'lam, he also speaks about the concept of masalih and mafasid greatly. Okay? A lot of people today will say to you, Akhi, there's a maslaha in this issue. But Akhi, it goes against the Quran and the Sunnah. How can this be referred to as a maslaha? This happens to so many people. And at the time of Abu Bakr, it happened to even some of the companions. And Abu Bakr corrected them. And an example for that was the issue of Usama ibn Zaydin taking the army. When the Prophet ﷺ died, Usama ibn Zaydin was 16 years of age. The Prophet gave him an army and said, run this army. Pay attention to this, brothers. Are we all together? The Prophet put him in charge. He gave him the position. The messenger died before the army can wage war. Abu Bakr took over the Khilafah. Abu Bakr, when he took over the Khilafah, the situation changed. A large quantity of people apostated. We're talking about 100,000 people apostated. And said to Abu Bakr, Islam is over now. Nabi Muhammad died, that's it. We don't have to pay, we don't have to pay zakat. Zakat is paid to the Prophet. Because they said, I in the Quran says, Take from their wealth. Meaning only Nabi Muhammad was being spoken to here. Not you, Abu Bakr. How dare you think this eye is talking to you? And then Abu Bakr said his famous statement, which is, Wallahi law mana'uni iqalan. Wallahi, if they refuse to give me the iqal. The iqal, by the way, is the black thing that you see that's put on the head. By the way, this thing, origin, if you go back, it was actually used to tie the camel onto the tree. And then they put it on their head, and now it's become a style. It's called iqal. Abu Bakr said, if they don't give me their iqal that they used to give to the Prophet, if they refuse to give me, forget money and something big. That rope that they tie their camel onto the tree, if they refuse to give it to me, I will fight with them for it. Now, Abu Bakr has thousands of people apostated and they left Islam. Okay, brothers. The situation has changed. Umar came and he said, okay, take down Usama. Usama is a young man. Change it to someone else. The maslaha calls to Usama being changed. Sah. It's a young man. 
It's the biggest army at that time who's going to fight with the Romans. The world power of that time. You can't trust it with a 16 year old. The whole entire Muslim army is in this man's hand. Abu Bakr showed that the, there's no such a thing as a maslaha when it comes to the Prophet's state statement. He said, Who put him in charge? Who put him in charge? Who gave him this position? Nabi Lahi Muhammad. That's the maslaha. That we follow what the Prophet said. And the thing that the Prophet commanded, Salawatullah wa salamun Are we all together, brothers? This was the time that Abu Bakr was showing the people the maslaha and the benefits on the khair is in the revelation, brothers. Huh? The Shaykh Rahimahullah spoke about here the following points. Write this down. He spoke about number one that we give precedence to bringing the good, sorry, give precedence to repelling the evil over bringing good. Number one. That was point number one he spoke about. Huh? That Islam it came to repel the evil first and bring about good. That's point number one. He also spoke about point number two. If there's two good running beside one another, we will take the higher of the two good. I'm in a situation where I've got this situation and this situation. I'm going to take which of those two is the best. Okay? Two benefits are running beside one another. I will take the higher of the two. The third thing that the Shaykh Rahimullah spoke about is Tazahum al Mafasid. Two evil are running beside one another, and I have to take one evil. I can't. I can't leave it. There's one evil I have to take. What is the example for that? An example for that is me dying or me drinking the alcohol. Me dying is a greater mafsada than me taking the alcohol. So what do, that, what do I do? I take the lesser of the two. Are we all together, brothers? The Sheikh mentioned those three. Uh, rahimahullah. He didn't mention something else. And that is... Yeah, let's not go into it. It's a top, big topic. Uh, yeah, we don't have much time. Let's go. Ahead. Carry on. ومن قواعد الشريعة التسير في كل أمر نابه التأثير وليس واجب بلا اختدار ولا محرم مع التضار مع التضار وكل محبور مع الضرورة بقدر ما تحتاجه الضرورة. The author now goes into um, the second type of the five major legal maxims. Write this down. The second, which is what. It is al mashaqqatu tajribu taysir When there comes hardship, Islam brings about ease. Are we all together, brothers? Are we all together, brothers? When hardship comes, what does the Sharia do? Hardship came. What does the religion do? It brings about ease. Ah. And the evidence for that is in the ma'al usri isra. An example for this is a man wakes up, he's sick, he has a terrible flu, his fever's high, the weather is very cold, he needs to do wudu to pray. There's a mashaqqah in this. Hardship is burden. It could cause his life. What does he do? Ease comes here. Shaka, it's hard on you. Tajribu taysir. Go and do wudu. Uh, sorry, don't go and do tayammum. Tayammum. Ah, don't shower. Don't wudu, drink, Don't do wudu. Don't touch the water. Your fever is too high. It's gonna probably increase your illness or even cause your life. Go and do tayammum. That's what Allah is in the ayah. Yuridu Allahu bikum al yusra, wa la yuridu bikum al usra. And the Prophet said in the famous hadith, Inna yusrun, wa lan ahadun illa wa The religion is based upon ease and simplicity. There is not a person who overdoes it except that they will overcome them. Okay? And Allah said in another ayah, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ Are we all together, brothers? Like in brothers, an issue that I think is important, I bring to your attention, which is... <coughs> 
um, the person who is traveling, why is it that he's not forced to fast in the month of Ramadan? Why is he allowed to not fast? Why is the Sharia permitted for him to break his fast? The one who is a traveler. What's the reason for it? Huh? Difficulty. Hey, yeah. Who believes difficulty? Put your hand up. Good. Scary now. Question, second question. Hey, yeah. What about if he has a private jet? Private jet. Rich man. He got a private jet. His house is five minutes walk from, five minutes from his private jet. He got he got a nice bed on his private jet. The minute he goes in there, he sleeps. He wakes up and he's told that he landed in his destination. Is he allowed to break his fast? Yes or no? Put your hand up. No, no. Question a second. Put your hand up if you believe he can break his fast. It's no hardship. Huh? You, you, believe, you believe he can break his fast. I want to I wanna see those people who said, huh? it was because of hardship. This man has not gone through any hardship. And he's allowed to break his fast, is he not? Is he not? If you say hardship, which is scary, then that would mean anyone who finds hardship in fasting, he would have to break his fast. Like for example, the man who works in the furnace is making bread and he's burning in the fire. He can break his fast. The nine to five who's, impl- who's carrying load in the month of Ramadan, he can break his fast. The person, uh, no, no, that's, not the, that's not the reason. Okay? Huh? Yeah, so but why is the wisdom? Why is, the, why, why is he in Allah? Yeah, so is it, is, it, is it like that? Is it shaita abudi? We're just allowed to, this is what it is? Or is there hikam and a wisdom behind it? And the reason why I ask this question is because once you connect your reasoning of why a traveler can break his fast, that reason can be given to anyone else now. If that reason is there. The ruling you gave to this one should give, be given to this one. Sah? And the fact that you can't do that, you have to say. So the word mashaka is one of those long discussed issues in books. Scholars go into details. But here, this book is... Um, it's not our purpose to uh, go too much into it. 